Good afternoon, and welcome to Policy at DEF CON. This talk is how do you solve a problem like Mirai, given by Kat Megas and Peter Stevens. Uh, a few announcements. So this talk is being hosted on the record, I believe. Um, as a courtesy to speakers, please keep your cell phones on silent. Um, if we have time for Q&A at the end, please use the mic so you can hear you. Please speak close to this, this mic um, in order to be, uh, you need this a little, the mic's a little soft, so try to get close to it when you speak. Um, as a reminder, the photo policy prohibits taking pictures without the permission of everyone in the frame. And with that, let's get started. Please welcome our speakers. Shall we go ahead and get started? Uh, introduce ourselves. Uh, I'm Kat Magus. I work at NIST. Uh, for those of you that don't know, NIST is the National Institute for Standards and Technology. We are part of the Department of Commerce. Uh, we are a non-regulatory uh, agency. Uh, pretty much everything we do is voluntary, uh, with the exception of when it comes to providing uh, cybersecurity guidance to federal agencies. But all right, I'm usually pretty loud, okay. Um, but um, outside of that, most of our work is uh, non-regulatory. We work very closely with private sector. Uh, we consider ourselves a research institute and uh, we publish publications and recommendations based on input that we receive uh, via our research and through engagement with the public. Hello, uh, so my name is Pete Stevens um, at the OECD. Uh, and so previously I was head of the Secure by Design initiative in the UK. Uh, so that included the team who worked on the Product Security and Telecommunications Infrastructure Act. Uh, so a lot of work on consumer IoT. And the purpose of this session really is for us to talk through some of the, the work that we both did, both in the United Kingdom and the USA, about how we reacted within, our gov within the government. Um, uh, to situations like Mirai, but also how that was a cal sort of a, a galvanizing experience to enable ministers to focus on IoT and to make a difference and to see what happened next. Um, so the purpose of this session and the flow we're going to follow is I think we're both going to take a few minutes to talk through some of the experiences that we had about that period of time um, and then open up for a few discussions. Really, really happy to have some questions as well. I know it's a really important topic that people are very interested in. Um, and it, of course, is iterating as we go. So that's something that's important. Um, so, Kat, I'll pass over to you. Okay. Um, so I will try not to spend too much time talking about policy, but I assume since you all are uh, coming to a talk given in Policy Village, you're interested at least remotely in uh, what is the policy landscape. So. Um, as, as kind of, you know, Peter mentioned, uh, Mirai was a big catalyst uh, and coming out of the Mirai botnet in 2017, the White House issued an executive order, 13800, directing the Department of Commerce and DHS to look at the issue of botnets and DDoS and what can be done to make the country more resilient. Um, Surprise, surprise, the cybersecurity of IoT devices was identified as kind of critical and on the critical path to securing our, our nation's uh, infrastructure. Coming out of 13800, uh, we've had a couple of other things that have happened since then. Um, U.S. Congress enacted the IoT Cybersecurity Improvement Act of 2020. That was legislation that was passed in 2020, which requires federal agencies to only procure and use uh, IoT devices that comply with minimum cybersecurity guidelines. Those guidelines were published by NIST and agencies as of December 2022. Yes, um, are uh, required to be compliant with those guidelines. Um, let's see, outside of that also, I like to highlight, if you're not familiar, there is legislation on the books in Oregon and as well as in California that require minimum cybersecurity for IoT devices sold both in Oregon and California. And while you may not think of the impact in that, if you look at the size of California's economy, 
Uh, as you might know or not, might not be aware of, if California were a country in itself, it would be the fifth largest economy in the world. Uh, so the idea of California establishing a minimum requirement for cybersecurity and saying that any IoT device that's sold to a consumer in California needs to meet reasonable cybersecurity guidelines, uh, it had a pretty significant impact. And uh, for those who were actually building IoT products, they paid quite a bit of attention to this. Uh, and that legislation was recently amended uh, to say, if you do comply with NIST guidelines for IoT, there will be a presumption of conformity with that legislation. And you will not have to be concerned about the uh, state of California looking at your device and, being, uh, and asking you, what have you done to build reasonable cybersecurity? Um, Something I like to talk about as well um, is an opportunity for feedback and for this community to engage. Uh, there was another piece of legislation, you may have heard of the NDAA that gets passed every year, um, which includes a lot of requirements for federal agencies that go beyond just defense and uh, DOD. In the NDAA of 2021, Department of Commerce was directed to stand up both a public group that consists of non-governmental stakeholders, as well as an IoT federal working group that consists of all the federal agencies that have equities or touch on IoT. We are on the hook to deliver a report to Congress, laying out for Congress what are the actions that the US federal government should be taking to enable IoT adoption, understanding that IoT is so important to other emerging technologies such as AI, um, as well as kind of understanding all of the socioeconomic benefits, as well as things like climate change and other benefits that IoT can actually bring. No surprise, uh, one of the pillars that have been identified is related to trust. If we cannot ensure that people can trust in the technology, whether you're a consumer, whether you're a farmer who's actually adopting IoT technologies, whether you're a healthcare provider, if they cannot trust the product, it is likely going to impact the adoption of this technology. Um, so. Heads up, that is a public group. They meet uh, every month. If you want to come in and address this public group and say, hey, I think it's really important that the following XYZ be adopted. And if it isn't, uh, I think there is going to be some long-term disadvantage to the US. Uh, you should feel free to uh, come in and give that comment. You can give it in person. You can submit it in writing. Um, and then, of course, kind of the the executive order 14028, which is the most uh, recent executive order that the White House issued, amongst lots of other uh, cybersecurity requirements, it directed NIST to develop and identify minimum cybersecurity criteria for IoT, for, for consumer IoT products, um, and also pilot those as a label. Um, I'll talk about it a little bit later, exactly what constituted the piloting and what that, those minimum requirements were. Um, and of course, in the most recent U.S. National Cybersecurity Strategy, uh, the commitment is kind of further demonstrated in that the, the White House kind of called out the importance in Objective 3.2 of uh, ensuring there is security in IoT. So when we first started our work, when uh, the botnet roadmap came out, uh, so the, the process was the executive order came out, uh, the Department of Commerce and DHS kind of consulted with non-governmental stakeholders about what can be done to address the botnet uh, threat. Coming out of that, the report identified IoT devices. So subsequently, there was a roadmap that was issued that said, here are the actions we are going to take to implement the, uh, the, the botnet report and the findings in the botnet report. Uh, so one of those was that NIST should identify what are the core minimum cybersecurity that IoT devices should have. And I can talk about the, uh, the existential um, issue around coming up with a minimum set of guidelines for, for, for IoT devices when we recognize that Risk is so dependent on context. Risk is not about the device. Risk often is about where's the device being used, what else is on the network where that device resides. So the idea of coming up with a single set of requirements that should be the baseline and apply across the board uh, was quite challenging, uh, especially because we have experienced in the past when we do publish minimum guidelines, 
it becomes a race to the bottom. Um, because really at that point, everybody feels like the minimum guidelines are probably all I have to do. Um, so coming out of that, what NIST did is we published two types of requirements that we recommended or capabilities for IoT. Half of those are technical, and they're focused on the actual device, and they say here's kind of the minimum technical cybersecurity you should build into any device that you are planning to sell in the marketplace. That should be, do you have the appropriate authentication mechanisms in place? Do you protect data, both at rest as well as in transit? But what we really introduced when we started talking about the baseline was this idea of the non-technical capabilities. And um, I'll be honest, when we first introduced the idea of non-technical capabilities, it did not get a lot of people excited. But we felt that identifying only minimum cybersecurity requirements without talking about you must have a vulnerability disclosure process. How do you disseminate information about your product to people who need to know? And how do you collect information about the security of your product like vulnerabilities? We talk about things, do you have a documented secure software development process? We don't define what process you need to have in place, but we do define that you need to have a process. It has to have certain elements to it. And you need to have it documented. Um, we don't necessarily tell you you have to disclose it, but we felt that just the discipline of going through and documenting what is your secure supply chain management process will really open the organization's eyes to potential cybersecurity risks and how to like manage that over the lifetime of the product. Question. Yeah. Um, so it was everything from, I mean, I'll be honest, it was everything from, well, if I have it documented, then I might be asked to share it with somebody. Um, and there were concerns around kind of being that open and transparent. Um, it was uh, concerns around, I mean, on the other flip side, we heard, um, where is the demonstrated proof that this is something that actually leads to better cybersecurity, right? Just the fact that you have a system, you know, a supply chain, you know, risk management plan in place, is there any demonstrated proof that that actually produces a more secure product? Um, we kind of felt there was enough evidence there that it was reasonable to ask for it. Um, and again, I think that was, this was already seven years ago. I think now, everybody's talking about it. Everybody seems to recognize, hey, a secure software development process is a good thing. But seven years ago, um, people really just wanted a checklist. Just tell me what I have to build into the product and tell me if I do these 10 things, I'm good to go. Um, and we felt strongly, no, you need to have a risk assessment. You need to do all those other things. I mean, that's very similar to what they did with NISM 71. Yeah. It's true, it's true. And I, I think, um, I do think that part of it is a concern around not so much doing it, but who do I share that information with, right? Um, there were also some practical concerns, right? So we say, hey, one of the first things you need to do is you need to identify the use case. Who's your user? What is the context of the use? You have to know that in order to be able to do a risk assessment in order to ensure that you're actually appropriately addressing risk. And, on the manufacturer side, they had some legitimate concerns where they said, hey, I build the device. I don't know what my customer does with it, right? So you cannot hold me responsible for imagining every possible way this customer may misuse this product. Um, I can only say, hey, I'm building the product because this is the use case I imagine it's going to be used in. So like in many cases, the devil's in the details. Um, and, and, and again, I do think there's some legitimacy, and that is why I'll talk about it a little bit later. We talked about having the capability in place. If you're a small, you know, two guys in a garage, and you are building your first IoT product, if you at least just write down on the back of a napkin 
This is what I'm going to do when somebody reports a vulnerability to me. You've at least taken a step further than where I think we were before. Um, but that is part of the reason we didn't go into very prescri prescriptive details. We wanted to kind of give that flexibility to the, to the market. Cool. Um, let me see. Sorry, 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 sorry. Oh, sorry, Peter. Yes. Um, so just real quick, because I think these are at the core of some of the conversations we're interested in having. Um, I'm used to joking about the fact that I'm always worried about like crossing a dark parking lot because I know I, somebody's gonna run me over one day um, because we do tend to try to kind of like push the envelope in some of our recommendations. So after the executive order 14028 that told us take the core baseline and adapt that to consumers since the core baseline was intended to address federal government, agriculture, healthcare, it was intended to address energy, any sector, but uh, we were challenged with taking that and tailoring it to the consumer market. So coming out of that, we made some changes to how we approached kind of the, the, the baseline, the core baseline. Um, so one of the things we changed was uh, most of the conversations up to that point had all been about the IoT device. We just need to secure the IoT device. It's just about the IoT device. As we started thinking about the device being part of a product, we recognize that very often that product is bought and becomes integrated with a, a, an enterprise system, but that product is that IoT device is still part of a vendor system. And often we lose sight of the fact that that product is also part of a vendor system. So as part of what we did under executive order, we said, well, there is an IoT device and the other product components that go with the device. And all those other product components, the mobile app, the back end, and the device, all need to support minimum cybersecurity requirements, right? I understand implementing that practically may be difficult because Sometimes you buy unbundled products. Sometimes somebody sells you a hub separately, then they sell you a device separately. Um, sometimes they use a third-party IoT platform. So I understand that reality is messy, but we felt that focusing only on the IoT device would give the consumer a false sense of uh, kind of security. Because a consumer buys a product, they, they think, this is, they don't realize that there are pieces of this product that are in the cloud or that, you know, hey, if I can control this through my mobile app and that mobile app isn't well protected, then all my information is at risk. Um, so that was one, one pivot we made. Um, there were a lot of conversations when we did our open stakeholder process. I'd say it was a 50-50 split between the lovers and the haters. Uh, and in the end, we felt kind of it was important that we would go out with this. And sure enough, um, right now is part of kind of the FCC program that they are uh, pursuing. I know that industry is thinking about how can we how can we look at componentizing this idea of certifying a system and pre-certify components so that when you assemble those components, you can actually say this product is end-to-end -end secure, um, but make it repeatable and reusable. So they are, they're still working on it and innovating. We can probably talk about the NPRM a little bit later. Um, the other thing we did is we talked about the criteria as cybersecurity outcomes. And you know, part of the reason we did this is we said, uh, Coming up with requirements for every IoT device out there would be impossible. Um, also, we didn't want to get too rigorous in our requirements because we feel that's very brittle. Um, we feel like uh, it would be best to rely on standards. And since I do belong to NIST and the S stands for standards, we have articulated what the government desires in terms of cybersecurity outcomes because we recognize there can be multiple standards. Your front door lock may implement security different than your smart refrigerator. So we don't expect there to be one standard. We don't think there should be one standard to rule them all, but we do think every single product needs to meet the cybersecurity outcomes. Um, and of course, the, the last thing that we did highlight is we said over and over, this is a baseline. This is a minimum requirement. There is, going to be, uh, there is going to be instances where something goes beyond this minimum baseline that may be higher risk, 
And you may have to tailor those cybersecurity outcomes, and you may have to either constrain them and say, yes, you do need to protect data at rest, but guess what? You can only, only use a hardware root of trust. Any other type of kind of encryption will probably not be sufficient. Um, and we also said you may have to go beyond the 10. Uh, there may be some cybersecurity outcomes that are go beyond that, and in fact, um, Again, I'm not sure if I mention it here, but the White House recently directed NIST to look at developing minimum requirements for consumer grade routers. And they, they basically said, hey, Kat, we think this might be one of those situations where a consumer grade router is actually a higher risk product than your typical device. And we are, we're just kicking off that public process. So we will be engaging on that. But um, that, was, that was kind of one instance of where we keep saying, it is just a baseline. That does not mean that it is going to be secure for every type of product. And we do think that it is important for the manufacturer to do a risk assessment. And ultimately, they are responsible for knowing if they need to go beyond the baseline. All right, now we can flip the slide. All right, this is my last slide. Uh, and then I will be turning it over to, to uh, Peter. I did just want to share, since we do want to talk about kind of and contrast kind of the labeling efforts or the non-labeling efforts that are going on around the globe as well as kind of what we're doing here in the US. I, I do have to caveat, I do not speak for the FCC. The FCC has graciously agreed to become the program owner for the US national mark. The NPRM, which is kind of the public rulemaking process, was just launched yesterday or two days ago. Um, so the, the FCC just came out and invited, invited Anybody is welcome to comment. Uh, in fact, I don't even think if you need to, uh, you know, provide your comments in any sort of format. Um, but these were the requirements, or at least these were the recommendations that we made at the end of piloting a consumer label, and we made in our recommendations to the associate, the. Uh, the APNSA, um, we made the following requirement, the recommendations about what should be included. So, first of all, we said there needs to be a consistent design for the actual label, which means you cannot expect a customer to uh, buy one product that has been through one certification process, the same type of product from a different certification process and expect the consumer to be able to understand that those two labels mean the same thing. So we said there could be different, different like certification programs and schemes, but ultimately they all have to have a consistent label, but also that that label needs to be layered. It needs to be binary because your average consumer, there was a lot of talk about this idea of a nutritional label. Um, and when we looked at our research that we did, and we also invited, obviously, comments from the public, um, they felt that cybersecurity for your average consumer was still might not be something that real time, standing at Best Buy, they're going to be able to compare two different nutritional labels and decide which one of the two products is appropriate for their risk. Um, but we did recognize that there may be some individuals who want that detail. So what the layer design does is on the product, it's binary. You either meet the requirements or you don't meet the requirements. But then you are able to go to some, some website, hosted TBD, that can actually provide, whether you're a security researcher or whether you are an individual who just wants to know more about the cybersecurity of that product, you can find additional detail. And that would all be part of, if you sign up for this voluntary labeling program as a manufacturer of an IoT product, you are signing up to do all of these things. Um, consumer education is critical. We don't want the burden to be completely on the consumer to be responsible for security, but we do also recognize the consumer actually does have a role in securing the product. Um, we think there has to be flexibility. As I mentioned, your front door lock, your refrigerator are not the same. Um, there should be multiple scheme owners in the US already. Um, there's quite a burgeoning market of IoT certification. I'm not sure if you guys are familiar. UL has one. Uh, there's another group called the Connectivity Standards Alliance. You may have heard of them. They're working on the standard, uh, the matter standard, and they are like extending a cybersecurity uh, specification into that now as well. Um, so there's quite a burgeoning existing marketplace of these uh, schemes. And we said, 
The government should not be setting up something separate. What we should be doing is we should kind of be setting a certain bar and then allowing these different schemes to operate and use what's already out there. Um, liability considerations were huge. Um, this is one of the things we heard from manufacturers and we said their concern is, this is voluntary and you're telling me I'm gonna make certain assertions about my product. Nobody's breaking down my door right now. Nobody's breaking down my door from the consumers that are saying, I need a more secure product. And all I'm doing is taking on liability by making certain claims about my product. So what exactly is kind of the motivation for me to actually join this voluntary program? And uh, the, the feedback we received is, there needs to be some sort of liability consideration uh, so that if somebody voluntarily does join the program and does do everything that we have recommended that they do, uh, that they would be held somewhat, you know, not liable if something were to occur. Um, we talked about outcome-based. We talked about standards, uh, international considerations and mutual recognition. That's why uh, we've talked to the UK and we're talking to others and, uh, of course, our recommendation was this needs to include both third-party certification as well as self-attestation. We do not want to stifle and inhibit innovation. We want to be able to provide that flexibility. And it's not only to address kind of the smaller companies, there are also some large companies. Samsung has come out and announced Samsung has been certifying products that attach the Sa Samsung, uh, what is it, the, uh, the Things uh, Cloud, I'm not sure what they call their back end again, I forgot. But they've been certifying products and saying, if you are attaching to the Samsung IoT platform, your device has to be certified for certain cybersecurity minimum requirements. So Samsung said, was saying, well, we are happy to self-attest because we have our own robust certification process. So. Um, I probably talked for a little too long, but... Um so, Kat, thank you so much, and it's a real pleasure to hear. And just to, there are many of the the, ten, the points there that can be echoed from my side as well about the, the role of the consumer and the importance of maintaining a, um, an awareness of the spectrum of, of, of uh, manufacturers who exist in this space. Sorry, I'm moving because my microphone's not oh, strong and long enough. Uh, yeah, go on then. Thank you. Thank you. Much easier. Um, no, 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 all good. So, I'm what I'm going to do now is just give you a bit of an overview of what we did in the UK, because following on from Mirai, I mean, a lot of context from my side is that I used to work for DCMS, um, which is the Department of Digital Culture, Media and Sport, um, which is a, a strange abbreviation, but it was where the de department, which was called the Ministry of Fun, um, but then all of a sudden they gave all of the digital uh, and cybersecurity and data privacy in one go, so it could have all entered that department. So um, the approach that we took here was to really be aware of the spectrum of manufacturers that exist and a kind of point of principle that we like to take on following from Mirai was saying, as Cap pointed out, you know, you have multi-billion dollar companies on one end, but also, you know, the, the two people in, a, in the garage um, trying to sort of make a small IoT device. So we wanted to make sure that we were creating something to, to support innovation whilst also at the same time trying to make sure that we were protecting consumers in a market where we know that they just aren't able to differentiate between what's secure and what's not. And what we found in the UK was that people overwhelmingly assumed that it already was secure because it was available on the market. And why would it be available if it was insecure? Um, so what I kind of thought about in this little sort of silly graph here is, is really the spectrum of uh, two axes, one of which is how much do organizations know about cybersecurity, and the other one is how much do they care. So you know, to Kat's point about the two people who are creating something in their garage, if they care a lot and they want to do the right thing, but they don't know how, then the government's response is going to be different to if someone is in a different position when there's someone who, who knows a lot but doesn't seem to care very much. And of course, that's the relationship between the carrot and stick. So what we did in, in DCMS, and again, a bit of context is DCMS does have ministers who are capable of introducing legislation. And the way legislation works in the United Kingdom is that for every roughly year, you have um, a parliamentary session, and the, the legislative agenda for that session is outlined in what's called the Queen's Speech, which is done by the Queen, now the King. And that sort of outlines all of the agendas. Now, in order to get into that speech, you either have to be one of two things. You either have to be included within the manifesto of the winning party, um, at which is clearly a called out to saying, the, we will do this piece of legislation. Um, or there are a number of small options for someone who can kind of fight to get the right into, that, into the speech. 
And just to be clear, we were not concluded and explicitly called out in the manifesto. So the, the challenge for us as a team was if we thought this was a significant issue, we needed to try and make sure that we were pushing ourselves to get into that second category. So I guess how did we think about it as an approach was, you know, I thought that maybe the way to do it is you basically have to cut out worst practice. That's your first objective. And in, at uh, Kat's point, have an inter, have a baseline of, uh, of uh, a hard baseline whilst also supporting um, through assurance schemes and also legislation. So quickly going through the Secure by Design approach, which was from 2018 to 2023, um, we would codify, just define what we mean by good practice, share it, support it. Um, we used to talk about this idea of having just something that we could constantly be, be sharing and be asking for feedback on and constantly iterating our approach. Um, whilst also building partnerships with you know, different countries, um, learning from what their experience was, of course, recognizing that they exist in a different legislative agenda and a different um, way of running governments, um, whilst also seeking to try and seek insights. And I can't overstress this enough how valuable it was for us to engage with members of the security research community, many of whom are involved in the DEF CON policy community here. So huge, huge eternal thanks. And there's a constant uh, attempt to get more engagement with that community. So. 2018, we published what was called the Code of Practice. Um, the Code of Practice, to Kat's point again, 13 points, outcome focused, very general, but sort of points which would be defining, you know, had Mirai happened, or in order to try and prevent Mirai from happening again, these things need to be in place. And what we tried to do was try and push it uh, and make sure it was available uh, in as many languages as we could. We know, of course, the UK is a relatively small market compared to the United States and other areas as well. So we tried to say, well, by no means were we saying, is this the best possible solution and this is the perfect fix, but here is an option and if you like it, please feel free to use it in whatever way you want and you can share that input with us. So we shared it in different, lots of different languages uh, and tried to make sure that we could, um, uh, we could get that done. So pushing work uh, with partnerships, we worked with a lot of different organizations, whether that's through standards development organizations such as Etsy and ISO, um, whilst also working with assurance scheme providers and other governments and other government departments. And I'm sure so another challenge that faces government departments in the United Kingdom is that you have ministerial um, portfolios which are defined by the prime minister and can change. And so what you end up with is, is historic and legacy departments which have an existential interest in that policy area. And so you end up with sort of many multiple different sort of uh, ministers that you have to gain engagement with. So it's important to have a cross-government approach which can slow things down. But again, if, you, if you're open and transparent with what your approach is and how you're hoping to deal with it, um, we, I think that actually helped to accelerate the process. Of course, we have to engage a lot with industry and also making sure engaging with consumers and consumer associations. So one piece of work that we worked very heavily with was um, helping to support the development of international standards. So we worked closely with um, a standards body based in Europe called Etsy, um, and uh, they created a piece of work which is called Etsy 303645. And really, that was for me, the learning was that um, it's, it's not just about, you know, I think that geopolitically it can get quite tense if you're saying, we've got the perfect solution in the United Kingdom and you should all do that when actually we should just share something and ask for feedback, ask for comments, and help make that idea more robust and, and develop it further. And I think enabling this process to go over to those kinds of organizations was incredibly empowering uh, to support the development of those standards. So what that also meant was we were creating that shared common language um, which we could then be used through assurance schemes and through legislation and through other different approaches as well. Something else that we realize is, to Kat's point as well, uh, it's not as though we want one standard to rule them all, um, because, uh, but there is a lot of commonality and consensus. I felt as though in the engagements that we were having that this idea that there are multiple standards was almost uh, symptomatic of um, in government or industry not quite knowing what to do. Whereas actually, I think what we could see from the multiple different outputs in, in standards bodies was there was a lot of consensus. And it was incredibly imp important to have this sort of mapping of that process to show that actually, yes, you had all these different, you know, ISO 27402 and um, Etsy 33645 and many, many others, but actually there's a vast majority of, of overlap and, and uh, agreement. And that's something to be celebrated rather than something that we should just try and point to these different outputs as well. So I found that really important for us and that's something that I think was, was helpful to, to help not just frame this as a UK approach, but frame it as something which, you know, we had published the code, but now we wanted to try and see how we can make this go further. 
So in 2019, we held a consultation um, where we asked a series of questions, which were, you know, should we do legislation? Um, if we did legislation, what kind of level would that look like? And we also developed a potential consumer labeling scheme to ask uh, for feedback on. Um, and what was really interesting is, yep. So what was really interesting um, was that it showed uh, near universal support for legislation, um, but an interesting um, duo uh, duology between um, those who supported and didn't support the label, which sounded like 50-50 was a similar kind of split. You had the one, one um, school of thought, which was this is a really helpful way to break through um, uh, and raise awareness and to make sure that, you're not getting, that you are getting rid of default passwords once and for all. But also, there's this idea that actually it would, could give people the full sense of security, that it's much more secure than it really is. Um, and if you make it voluntary, it also would be challenging for us to, to have that because you would end up with potentially organizations that were going far further already. And if we were now saying the minimum baseline was you needed to just have a coordinated vulnerability disclosure program and have a no default password, um, then actually the quality of security might go down. And that was definitely something that we didn't want to see in the UK. Um, and that was some of the feedback that we heard um, in, in that approach. So that, again, that was in 2020. We had, a, we had the call for views on the legislative approach. And we talked through the various approaches of what the uh, potential enforcement approach might look like, um, what the obligations would be on the organizations, what the security requirements would be. Um, and we, we made sure that we were, we were pushing that. But as I was saying, back to the sort of the graph with the caring and knowing, um, we wanted to make sure we were supporting um, assurance schemes as well and training. So we, we invested some grant funding for small and medium-sized enterprises who were, you know, wanting to enter this space once for the first time so they could learn a bit more about what it meant to implement a coordinated vulnerability disclosure program. And then we made them all free of charge. We supported a third party to create that. Um, and also we created, uh, through grant funding, a series of assurance schemes for smart televisions, um, children's toys, and also for um, a self-assessment framework that organizations could use for themselves to assess against that. So again, trying to, at the same time, communicate that we were, on the one hand, looking to raise the bar, looking to develop legislation, but also um, uh, to um, be supporting com companies to help face it, sort of to help drop that hurdle. So something, again, that we were doing a lot in the government, and I'm sure you know, all governments do this, is to try to track and assess, you know, is this a threat? Is this an issue that we definitely need to solve through legislation? Because in an ideal world, you know, when we first started, we thought we'd publish the code and companies would just immediately do it and because we'd published good practice and that we thought would be helpful. Um, I think we had to make sure that we tracked and assessed um, through surveys and through um, other engagements to see you know, how prevalent is bad practice and how, how much of it is it changing over time. So there was an organization called the Internet of Things Security Foundation which could look at the adoption of coordinated vulnerability disclosure programs to say you know, it was about you know, 80%, 10%, 12%, which in the market was just, you know, we were looking at maybe closing the gap by about 2,200. So we thought this wasn't really working in the way we needed to, which helped us to really amplify the need for legislation. So in 2021, uh, we had our, another call for views um, where we shared uh, the approach and we were able to gain ministerial feedback. So we then went to ministers and said, this is a really important issue um, and we have solicited feedback from a wide range of organizations and we think that clearly there is a need for, leg for legislation here. Um, again, engaging directly with the security community in some cases, it was so helpful for me to be able to have some, some clear examples um, that maybe some in the press, some of them in word from the press to be able to share and say, you know, these are things, the kinds of harms that could be existing for citizens if we're not doing something about this, which was really empowering to help us engage with ministers. And we were successful in securing that, um, that support in both in February and then in May, through that engagement, we're able to actually get securement into the Queen's speech and then introduced into Parliament. Um, something that's probably worth mentioning, and I know we're running short of time, is when you'd introduce something into Parliament, um, you have to have what's called an impact assessment, which is an assessment of the financial um, uh, costs and benefits associated with delivering legislation, as opposed to just leaving things as they are. Um, and those are very, very challenging to exhibit in a world where you know, information sharing isn't commonplace. Um, and so that was something that we had to um, consult and secure some information, but also have, a, have some assumptions. Um, so I guess plea to all of you is, you know, this, there is active engagement to try and secure more support and secure more on how we can collect this evidence to support the future development legislation. Um, so just back to the story, and we developed, so 
parliamentary, uh, we got royal assent in December 2022, um, which meant that it's now an act. Um, and what that has meant is that we have a framework which enables Parliament to define the minimum requirements for this category of devices. And in April, in July 2023, we, um, or the UK government, introduced um, a series of regulations which are the definitions of what the minimum requirements are. So no default passwords, making sure that you have a coordinated vulnerability disclosure program and making sure that at the point of sale, the, the product um, has clear information about how long that product will be supported with security software updates. So what that means is that by the 29th of April 2024, um, we in the UK, that will, that will then become law and, and it will be enforced and will be enforced by an enforcement authority who will be able, you can report if you think there's any of these products which are not meeting that requirements and that will then be in, including a, a, a fine um, if, they, if they continue to, um, to not do that. So I think that's, that was, you know, so in the UK that was the process we went through to get to legislation um, at a very high level. I think in the UK as well, um, there's a lot of work, and Kat was mentioning about the work on routers. There is work that's happening on enterprise devices and the de these devices used within uh, enterprises and businesses. Um, and I think that's a really important topic. Um, uh, and I'm looking forward to, to seeing how that, how that work develops. So just back to here, and I think we talked a little bit about the, the work of labels and interoperability versus alignment. But um, Kat, do you have any particular views that you'd like to talk about maybe on the interoperability side um, that you'd like to mention there? Yeah. yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so I will try to be brief, which uh, seems to be a problem for me. Um, we hear consistently, and I think it's a valid concern, from the producers of products who say, hey, all of you got to get together because it is a global marketplace. We cannot be having product A for the US, product B for Singapore, product C for the EU, product D for, uh, for the UK. You all have to kind of get on the same page. At the same time, though, we are all so different, right? Some countries, like the European Union, have very top-down regulatory approaches, very prescriptive requirements, right? In the US, we tend to take more of a voluntary approach, and we provide broad guardrails, and we tell private sector, as long as you kind of stay within these guardrails, we let you manage your own risk. Uh, it's only when you step outside of those guardrails that there's enforcement. Um, and also, we all have such diff manufacturing bases, right? In the US, there's a different sort of uh, spirit of innovation and you know, uh, small businesses. Uh, again, everybody's very different. So how can we all agree on exactly the same requirements. So we hear a lot, you all need to align. You all need to yep. like say the same thing and do the same thing. And I, I, I think that's such a challenge. I, I, I think also in a world where there's never to be any geopolitical tensions of countries not wanting to be seen to ceding that responsibility, but also um, uh, <laughs> I think that, so how can, sorry, I've completely forgotten what I'm saying. Um, so, and, and so we have parliamentary sovereignty, need to respect that, and also recognizing that these country, that every country wants to be uh, enabling their approach to be interoperable with what the other, con other countries are also doing. So I really feel as though the more we can su support and signpost the fact that it's great work here, and if you're doing this, that's interoperable, but I also feel as though it's, it's inevitably, from a political standpoint, it's always going to be problematic to aim for overarching kind of alignment. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So to me, I think the key is, as long as we don't actually conflict on requirements, yep. and as long as, you know, dare say, you know, somebody say you have to build X, Y, Z, uh, you know, uh, uh, legal enforcement uh, access into your process, and another country says we don't, uh, we don't have that requirement, we require just the opposite, I, I think this could work, yep. uh, but no, yes. I, I, I do think that, I think, yes, we've got questions here, we've got five minutes left, so please, sorry, question. I think that you're right that the delta is important, but I think so, so too is the commonality. And I think, again, much of the regulatory approaches have been designed to not be overburdensome. And so focusing on getting the, you know, the core principles, the core basics right, 
So actually, I, I do think that, you know, often the difference is about the implementation as opposed to the expectations. So the expectations, I think, are, are, are quite similar. So tools like standards mapping tools, perhaps regulatory mapping tools would be a helpful approach as well to see like, how these regulations and expectations within them do differ. That could be a helpful tool as this matures. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. I, um, I do want to call attention to the Connectivity Standards Alliance, uh, which some of you are nodding, so you've obviously heard of them. Uh, they're undertaking an effort where they are coming up with what uh, you, know, you might call it like a super, super specification. And it takes the requirements of Singapore's label. It takes the requirements of Germany's label, the EU, um, what the UK is doing, um, what the US is doing. And they are actually creating a set of requirements where they overlap. It's the same requirement. They're adding anything that goes beyond it. I don't think they have found anything that conflicts. And what their dream is, that when they finish with the specification, if you meet the specification, you are guaranteed to meet every single country's requirements. And they're hoping that you'll actually be able to build a certification program out of that and say, you go through the testing process once, but that test report can then meet every single country's requirements. So while we are not completely aligned, there can be interoperability, I hope. Between ourselves? I think it depends. Yep. Yeah, depends. I mean, with the U.S. and the and, and the U.S. and the U.K., I think we have a very strong collaboration of, of going back, and so we are able to share a lot of information. Um, I think some countries like the EU, um, you know, they have their CRA. If you're all mm -hmm. tracking that, right, um, which is coming down the path, which is it's quite IoT and all the IoT backend components kind of connected. They tend to have a more rigorous process. I don't think they have as much flexibility to engage because they are very regulatory. Mm -hmm. So it, it depends, I think. You know, and then you've got the quad and you've got all the you've got these different fronts and, and I think everybody wants to, to engage. Uh, but I think some countries are more constrained than others. Yeah. And hey. if I sorry. If I may highlight the other challenge as well is the way NIST works, we engage with our stakeholders. We don't ever unilaterally say we believe this is a requirement and we don't negotiate and I don't sit down with Peter and say yeah my stakeholders told me this is really important but because you guys don't have it yeah I'll go ahead and drop it even though I've got two and a half thousand comments that I got during the public comment period that said Kat you need to add this so it is hard to stay in lockstep because we have our processes to follow. And, yeah. I, but I do think that it has been so helpful to hear and listen to what kind of what you have been hearing and to see how it aligns with us and also, you know, how, you know, we talked about consumer labeling, we talked about the importance of consumer, you know, consumer awareness. And uh, I, I do I do feel that it is an incredibly empowering tool, but also the, the sense of information sharing as much as possible, you know, how can we signpost when we, we do publish information? Of course, all government employees are very focused on their own countries and what they're doing, but actually it has been really helpful for, for Kat to send us an email saying, hey, we just published this new report, please, you know, just, just so it's on your radar so that I can review it, but also I can share it to communities in the UK, and every now and then we can say, you know, these are the kinds of consultation processes we're taking place to try and maximise the impact for where it's appropriate, we can do so. Um, so again, I think that's helpful, but I'm aware I'm people waving at me that we are running short of time, so I'm very, very sorry for that. If you'd like to continue the conversation, please do um, yeah. feel free to give us a card. And can I just say a huge thank you to Kat Megas as well for joining today. It was really great to no, come you. in. And uh, thank you very much all for, for taking part. Thank you.